This conversation is part of non-extractive architecture, a research residency and platform hosted by the AC Foundation and curated by Space Caviar at Palazzo Zattere in Venice. Um, non-extractive architecture is about um, the pursuit of a new type of architecture that doesn't exploit the planet in various ways. My name is Luke Jones. I'm one of the uh, resident researchers as part of the first phase of non-extractive architecture. And um, I'm joined by some of the others here um, who are going to be part of the conversation. It's possible also that some of the curators may join remotely at some point. Um, they're not currently on the stream, but um, I think they might. Um, so we're joined today by Material Cultures. Uh, Material Cultures is a, a not-for-profit research organization working at the intersection of low embodied carbon and high efficiency offsite construction, developing prototypical designs for low and high density housing, commercial and cultural uses. And we're joined by its principals, Paloma Gormley of Practice Architecture and Summer Islam of Studio Abroad. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And um, yeah, we're really, really excited to talk to you about your work and um, really interested in how it's grounded both in this very sort of systemic analysis of materials and their effects on the environment, uh, but also very much in the sort of literal practice of, um, of architecture and construction. So I'm going to hand over to you now. Uh, thanks, Luke. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Paloma, and this is Summer. Um, and together, we established Material Cultures in 2019. Um, before I talk about um, what we do, I'm going to talk briefly about stuff and the material culture that we find ourselves in now. Um, for many millennia and in many parts of the world today, uh, we made and make buildings out of stuff. Um, so stone from the ground, this is limestone, um, or wood from our forests. Stuff that didn't move very far from where it was found, and uh, stuff that essentially is an extension of, of the landscape. We developed kind of highly sophisticated building typologies like these, which are kind of 500 year earth towers in Yemen. Um, and material strategies where the materials used have a direct visual and kind of technical um, link and relationship to the, to the architecture and the landscape around it. Um, or something like this in Southern Asia, um, which is a building made almost entirely from straw. Or these sod houses yeah, in Iceland, um, which are clad and insulated with turf. Um, critically, these processes were inherently circular and in many ways they were kind of highly sophisticated. Our current material culture is defined by global supply chains and economy of scales, and a distinctly proprietary approach to architecture. So as architects, we are increasingly the kind of specifiers of, of systems, of products. They're often composed of, of a number of different materials, and it's almost impossible to discover where they originated from. This combined with a kind of regulatory framework and a culture of liabilities has led to a high levels of, kind of product specificity, where every product in the build-up of a, of a wall, for example, has a very specific role. Um, this is kind of highly legible in, in the breakdown of a building's fabric uh, with a kind of typical wall containing, I'd say, an absolute minimum of around eight materials, if not many, many more. Um, up until really recently, our approach to sustainability broadly uh, has been almost entirely focused on energy consumption and use with very little interest in embodied carbon. So in kind of passive house terms, which has been the kind of dominant uh, culture of sustainability, a sustainable building is at least is these things kind of highly insulated, super airtight, with heat recovered ventilation, a lot of kind of technology. Um, which is reducing energy consumption and use. Uh, and we do that with extraordinary materials. Um, 
So things like butyl tape, uh, PVC membranes, polyurethane foams, um, materials which uh, are very high performance, but are almost exclusively actually oil-based. And the consequences of this material ecology uh, or material um, kind of technology are, are many. Um, I guess some of the most devastating ones are the amount of carbon produced um, and then the, the, the waste produced and the uh, inability to recycle that waste. Um, something that's being talked about more and more, I think, and understood a bit better than uh, in, in recent years is the toxicity of these materials and the fact that they continue to come back us into our environments for many years um, after they're installed. Um, and then there are more existential questions about uh, uh, kind of accessibility uh, for, a, for a user. Um, buildings have become very kind of technical and technocratic and as occupiers, we've kind of lost uh, a relationship to the building, how it's made and how it might be maintained. Um, and alongside that created these environments where because of this kind of layering, um, we're very far away often um, from the real kind of matter and fabric of a building. Um, so there's this kind of inherent alienation that we think comes from that. So our question um, at Material Cultures is what happens if we um, try at least to return to, to a more direct relationship with the stuff. And so we've developed um, a set of principles by which our work can begin to address the issues we see in the construction industry today. And we begin uh, with inherited knowledge. So looking back before we look forward, um, so our building systems combine contemporary technologies with traditional knowledge, and we draw from techniques and materials that have been proven through centuries of testing and use. An important element of our work is considering the impact of what we do socially as well as physically. So we're committed to developing local supply chains for the construction materials we use. And we consult with our clients and local supply chain partners to ensure that local value systems are created in the places in which we work. Working with nature reflects our circular economy principles. So we're interested in systems which use natural materials that can be integrated with the ecosystem at the end of their life. Essentially, this means that they decay and become compost. And as they're sourced from the land, they're also inherently low carbon and low impact. It's also critically important to us that these principles are effective at scale, which is why efficiency and performance is crucial to the design and also the implementation of our systems. Offsite manufacturing and end-to-end -end building information modeling uh, allows us to improve our efficiency and minimize waste and also improve working conditions on site. The buildings we design are made to last and to long outlive the average new build home without compromising on the quality of the environments that we create. So we work really carefully with our construction partners to ensure build quality and material provenance and make homes which are robust. A necessary and important shift also in the material cultures that we exist within today is one towards individual agency. So to ensure that the buildings we live in today can be passed on to generations to come, we need to understand how they're assembled and how they can be maintained and cared for to prolong their life. So we provide user manuals for buildings that we design, information which supports and empowers our clients to improve and also adapt their buildings over time. And so as material cultures, we conduct research into the ways that our built environment can be low carbon and low impact and low cost. And also in this research, we work with engineering firm Arup to develop our systems and track the embodied carbon and circular principles of our work. And we also work with industry partners to implement this knowledge. Um, and a very important element of the work we do, which is developmental, is teaching, because uh, through our teaching, we can experiment and we can collaborate and share what we found through our research with our students. We work with uh, one of our industry partners, um, is the brick manufacturer HG Matthews, at whose factory we have our own prototyping and testing workshops. 
and also with our academic partners, the UAL and the UCL, we teach and collaborate and develop ideas with our students. Our learning is conducted through making and building and our design and build projects explore particular details. So this house, for example, um, was designed with our students at Central St. Martins and looks at the design of the hempcrete SIP with residential U values. It was a building designed with 30 MRC students working together to form an entire design and contracting team designing in BIM um, and developing kind of set of principles by which an ecological um, home design could be developed and then executed by a group of people. This project we developed at the CAS with Unit 7 led by Paloma and David Grandorge explored the use of acetylated timber foundations and was recently awarded the Sustainable Project Prize and the AJ Small Project Awards. And this outdoor classroom for the Grisdale Art Centre in Cumbria was built at a workshop we led with Takeshi Hayatsu and was designed without concrete fittings using a dry stone walling plinth and rocks from the riverbed weigh, weighing down the roof. Um, we sourced boulders from a nearby quarry to resist uplift on the eaves and try to experiment with different ways that a building can be grounded in a landscape without resorting to the kind of um, first concrete principle of using a foundation. We collaborate on this project with engineers and consultants um, and groups of students <laughs> who form an, impl an important part of the learning we do as a group together. So we learn through our hands and through testing. Mm -hmm. This is uh, these are the farmers who are our clients for the project. Um, so we work with people like this, and um, this is Pete from Structure Workshop, um, and try to work at scale often, um, building kind of prototypes uh, at one to one. So we always try to test things at the scale that they were, um, that they will eventually become, because materials don't necessarily scale that well when you kind of model with them. Um, this is a project that someone briefly mentioned um, that I developed with David Grandorge at the London Metropolitan um, University. Uh, and it was developed kind of concurrently to, to uh, Flathouse, um, which is a kind of large scale prototype in a way, um, or demonstrative project to use technical language. Um, it's a prefabricated panelized building and it's assembled of kind of load, load bearing components. So cassettes that are also structural, but prefabricated off site. Panels are infilled with hemp, um, which in this case was grown on the surrounding land. So there's a kind of field just behind the building uh, where the hemp grew and then these cassettes were put together um, at a, a factory. Um, the, the panels themselves were erected in, in just two days. Um, and the hempcrete is a kind of unusual material um, because it provides both uh, insulation, but also wall mass. So it's kind of a re return to monolithic construction where uh, I guess in contrast to the, the building, the kind of layering of materials that, that we saw earlier on in the presentation, we're really just looking at one, one, or, one or two materials in the entire kind of thickness of the wall. Um, we also worked in collaboration with Margent Farm, who are the client on this project, to develop a, a new cladding material. So this material takes the other part of the plant, which is uh, the, the fibre, um, and combines it with a bio-based resin and it's pressed into these kind of corrugated panels, which are they're the same profile as any agricultural shed, but they're made of completely bio-based materials. So they can essentially return to the ground and they behave like any bio-based material in that they kind of respond to UV. So the color has changed over the building's lifespan. Um, this is an interior shot, just giving you a sense of um, those panels. So I guess as a demonstrated project, we were interested in um, really 
showing and revealing the kind of construction and the matter of, of the building. Um, so you see the hempcrete uh, and you see the, the kind of structural grid um, or the kind of uh, columns and uh, secondary structure of, of the building on show. Um, and then it, in relation to its, its landscape. Uh, the building is a, is a family home um, and one of our intentions, I guess, is always to provide spatial variety. So compressing the bedrooms um, on the lower ground floor uh, and then where possible, uh, really creating kind of generosity. Um, it's built very cheaply, despite kind of having these generous spaces and double height spaces. Um, and together with our students at UCL last year, we kind of tried to take these principles and apply them to a kind of larger scale um, typology of buildings. So we were looking at kind of four or five stories um, and what it would mean to kind of transfer this technology uh, to a kind of block of flats or to a tower, for example. This is a project by Maria El Salvador. Um, and then also looking at kind of urban configurations and how these typologies might interact with each other. I'm going to talk a little bit now about some of the research work that we've been doing uh, over the past few years. So this project, um, which is a development of what we called an ecological action framework, addresses some of the tensions that we're interested in and aware of in our work between in some ways what's the pull of history in terms of our interest in vernacular technologies um, and a push towards what Kenneth Frampton called a universalization. So um, we're interested in a kind of discussion around what it is to work regionally and what a critical regionalism looks like in the 21st century in the context of the climate crisis. So it begins with an analysis of the RIB plan of work and what we looked at um, with the MARC students at Central St. Martins uh, was alternative stages or amendments to the stages of work we use in practice in the UK um, as defined by the RIBA. Um, exploring the impact, for example, of the early integration of BIM into a project on the risk and cost of the work you might be developing, or what it would mean to start a project rather than end it with its material specification and to be led by the embodied carbon of those materials in the design decisions and strategic decisions of a project. We also looked at what it might mean if information were more effectively shared across a full project team from the designer to the policy makers down to the laborers and users. And then we then explored uh, together what critical regionalism looks like uh, today and what the language of housing might be if we were able to build radically low carbon regionally specific housing models and how each of these might respond to their own regional, social and economic context. So critical regionalism advocates that buildings should be sensitive to the existing conditions in site as a political tool also to counter the kind of commodification of architecture into a global consumer product. And we looked at the different regions of the United Kingdom um, and what industries and resources were prevalent in the various landscapes across the country, looking at the forests, the geology of their place, uh, and also their economy and social makeup. And, um, narrative histories so to have a kind of full understanding of place in which we were then to design homes and to understand also the material supply chains of these places and how kind of local manufacturing process can uh, be keyed into large-scale development work so all of this research um, which is really inherent to the process of design for us uh, led to the development of these regionally responsive housing types which were designed within a few weeks um, all designed in BIM, um, manipulating digital technologies to explore construction techniques which are rooted in inherited knowledge and have none of the precision of CAD. And um, they offer um, to us an alternative to the status quo response to the need for more housing, an alternative material culture, um, expressing a concern in the local, in an increasingly global context and making a case for the topographic climatic conditions of site the tectonics of architectural construction and also the tactile sensibility of architecture. But it's also weighed against our knowledge of the relative carbon impact of different processes and national material supply chains and all the regulatory processes 
which are in place, which make all of the kind of ambitions we have often uh, very difficult to implement. So we began this research with questions about the impact of context on design, but we concluded it with questions about how you can draw boundaries today around your immediate context and practice, and uh, especially now that we live in such a global material culture. And maybe it's important just to say that we're currently working on um, a project which is an extension of this research work in Yorkshire, which is working with the councils there and in the Humber in the northeast to put together essentially a kind of um, strategy of how they will work towards um, kind of transformation in the construction industry. So um, they want to go bio base and we're working out how they can do that but in terms of kind of supply chains design education kind of across the entire spectrum um, and we're also taking the principles and um, kind of embedded in flat house and some of those other kind of research projects that we've been doing looking at kind of eliminating concrete from foundations bringing in kind of the regional approach to materiality um, and then applying that to a large scale housing project in Lewis. Um, yeah, so those, those, what I guess what we've just shown you is, is being applied at, at scale um, and in specific contexts. Um, currently, TBC, <laughs> the outcomes of which uh, we shall see in a, in a year's time, I guess. Cool. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that. Yeah, is it all right? Could we ask some questions? And uh, that was a really fascinating presentation. Um, I guess I had a sort of question that I wanted to ask at the beginning, which is like an annoying one, but the two things which were coming into my head were these sort of compromises and obstacles, I guess, mm. sort of encounter in the process of create this like grounded, localized, re-materialized, re-kind of bio-based. Um, architecture. I mean, obviously, I guess like global supply chains coalesced around these wonderfully standard, wonderfully available um, kind of industrial petrochemical materials for a reason. So, I mean, what are the what are the kind of problems that need to be overcome, or the kind of are there sort of either either kind of local and specific, or like broad and systemic issues that have to be overcome in order to make this type of construction more feasible um, to kind of push it beyond the prototypes. I, th I think one thing is that there's kind of an illusion that the materials that we currently depend on are more standardized or standardizable. The, the, even within crude oil, there are huge varieties in terms of its um, makeup, its uh, viscosity. Uh, so the, I guess everything is raw at the point of, of extraction and natural to an extent just describes the amount of processing that it's been through. You could describe crude oil as a kind of bio product, you know. Um, but I think because it's, uh, um, because it's such a ubiquitous um, resource, mm -hmm. it's come to dominate um, so many kind of markets and fields and um, are, uh, you know a lot of those processes I guess are kind of invisible to to us and the amount of work that is involved to transform it into into these different products into a quite a European flame insulation for example um, is extraordinarily complex uh, and actually the things that we're talking about are much simpler uh, and require far less infrastructure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think to kind of follow on from what you were saying, I guess the, a lot of it's misconception and a lot of it's uh, lobbying. <laughs> and there are, there's a lot of, um, yeah, like ingrained habit in the construction industry. And I suppose one of the things that we're looking at in this project in Yorkshire is how you start to unpick that from the kind of grower of a material down to the person who's trained in installing it in a building and 
all the different points on that supply chain that you have to have new conversations to kind of almost have conversations that we were having hundreds of years ago again and also we're also working with a local authority to see what actions they could be taking to start to undermine the kind of ingrained culture that we have, that we exist within and yeah there are there are obstacles of course um but we think it's just a matter of kind of adjusting thinking and action towards towards them um so we will be able to tell you more about those actions in six months <laughs> i guess as a sort of follow-up so are the do buildings like this require something different from the user or the person who lives there or is it is it it's is that something which is really just has to be worked through in the process of construction is the um does it require a different sort of maintenance or a different sort of awareness on their part or i think is there it... is an element of that yeah um in that most of these materials um rely on breathing construction and um, to function really well uh which means vapor being able to kind of move across in and out of, of that wall build up so something that the people need to be aware of is that you need to maintain that permeability and to an extent understand it if you want to start getting involved in your building fabric um but beyond that i mean and, and then i guess there is the potentially a conversation around maintenance and additional um, kind of maintenance and labor. But I think we've also been, again, sold a bit of a fantasy about these kind of maintenance free materials um, that are, you know, meant to last forever and not to degrade. And that often that's just not true. Um, and what we do instead is replace the whole thing wholesale because it was terrifyingly cheap in the first place um, so i guess there's a different culture and relationship to longevity in that sense and if you look around any city the buildings that are still the, you know still there the oldest and actually probably in the best condition are generally the ones that were made with in a very direct way with, with quite raw natural materials um. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I really appreciate the kind of groundedness of your of your work. So sorry, we we just lost connection to you for can, 20 seconds. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now you're back. Um, I had a question about the use of BIM in relation to identifying local material sources. On one slide in small text, it said that BIM could facilitate um, the ability to kind of locate these these sources is that currently a manual process of moving back and forth between gis data google research local context i'm yeah. I, I guess my question is how does something a software that's working mostly at the building scale mm -hmm. connect to it's like regional um material sources does mm -hmm. that connection exist yet I guess it currently exists in the context of, let's say you're, you're working for a contractor and you have a highly developed BIM model, you would be with a very intelligent BIM model in a position to order an element of your model if you click on it. And if it's embedded with that, that, in, that intelligence, it's sourced from this builder's yard down the road and you can add 10 to your basket and just order it through. So that exists. I guess what we're talking about is a world where you are also able to use the intelligence. I mean, it's, it's entirely possible, it's just not cultured. And um, the way that we we work with this information, and also there's like a lot of resistance to BIM. Like we talk about it, and there's always a bit of a flinching from other architects. Um, but but it could it could facilitate that, and absolutely, there's no reason that these material supply chains couldn't be accessible. It's just uh, historically they've been fairly small because uh, an interest in these materials is uh, is only growing now. Um, but also there just isn't somebody that's um, been facilitating the kind of sharing of that information. Um, and, you know, so it's a Google research job today. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, there well, aren't any yeah. standards yet for anyone to sign up to, you know, mm -hmm. for any product developers, et cetera, to, to stand up to, uh, sign up to in terms of 
cradle to cradle, cradle to cradle to gray, gray, cradle to gate standardization, you know, um, until there is a um, kind of reasonably university recognized standard that there is unfortunately going to be this kind of variation and ambiguity really about who's working with what data, how, but, um, and it becomes an individual responsibility to, to make sure that you're not, that, yeah, that the information that you have is the best information that you could be working with. Yeah, I, I, I found it quite interesting, at least in my experience of working in kind of large architecture firms, starting with massing and form finding, and then kind of towards the very end of that process is when you get down to the scale of the material. And I think it's interesting in your work, I see the kind of potential of the flipping of that relationship or through some sort of more intelligent regional BIM model or something, being able to start the process rather with a set of constraints, starting really from the material and then working towards the like, this like possibility space of forms becomes much more limited in like a productive sense, which I think I think is really nice. Tomorrow I'm talking to um, someone who's doing research on video games as a platform for building design. And it's very much on my mind, like how the, the digital softwares, the limitations that we impose in the digital softwares can, I don't know, somehow limit these possibilities in a productive a productive sense so yeah yeah i think it's a really interesting idea that the limitation is productive it's not at all how it's seen i think so but that's one of one of the res elements of resistance to something like bim certainly from my perspective in an office like a working previously in a very design-led office, the idea of BIM was that it must in some way limit you to a set of components and that that was problematic. Um, but when we start projects, uh, we might like look at the who's growing what nearby or what sawmills there are, and that's how we start. And then we also start from a kind of point of interest and understanding of like how easy it is to get certain sizes of timber or whatever. And that's useful and it, is, it does feel productive, but it doesn't, necessarily chime with lots of different ways. I was certainly not in the way I was taught to design, um, not at an undergrad level, and certainly probably not also at postgrad level where I studied. I had a, a sort of question relating to, I really enjoyed in the presentation, the way that you counterpose um, the effort on one hand to try to systematize and on the other to, to try and leave space open to reinvent the wheel a little bit with every project. And um, I was interested to hear a little bit more about how your experience of that has developed through doing these, these buildings. It seemed like a lot of what was universal or what seemed to be transferable between these different models and potentially these different streams of material is often a timber architecture or a kind of timber frame architecture. Um, and I sort of, I, I wondered if there were other aspects of it, which for, for you did sort of express this, this maybe sort of high level, more sort of universalizable, systematizable thing. Are, you know, are, are what we, is what we're looking at really a kind of, a sort of expansive kind of universal timber architecture which can be augmented and filled in with all of these different sorts of streams or is is that an oversimplification i don't think it's far off um yeah i mean essentially um we always find in these conversations um that the material palette that we're talking about is actually very limited um you know you end up talking about four or five things mixed in different ways in different contexts combined um, to do different things but at, at the heart of that is always timber um, unless you're talking about stone but we have been unfortunate enough not to have clients <laughs> that can afford um, kind of stone buildings from scratch um, 
but I think that is a really interesting conversation, um, this kind of stone conversation. Uh, and I and it also seems completely plausible that in time, stone cross should be able to challenge those of concrete. I mean, there's, I think Web Yates and others have been doing really interesting work just showing some kind of ridiculous uh process whereby you take sandstone grind it down heat it to thousands of degrees uh, and end up with material which has half the compressive strength um uh, and has cost tons and tons and tons of, of carbon um so you know within that process it you, you do just wonder why we can't just have the limestone, please, mm. for the same cost, if not less. Mm. Um, uh, so that's one thing. Yeah, but yes, essentially, I mean, if you, I think, if if we're doing things at speed at uh, scale, and I guess the other factor with timber is it's bio-based and it sequesters carbon, um, and this is a big debate uh, about how relevant that sequestration is. Um, but uh, yeah. There is an argument to be said that you know the more the more bio-based materials we can use, the better. Um, and ideally, those materials should be in a building for a long time. But um, in terms of standardisation, yeah, it's really interesting dialogue um, where I, th I guess we're using kind of small-scale projects where we can experiment. Um, to iterate, test, experiment, um, and push ideas and shift shift what we're doing, and then and then applying those back to the large scale. Um, and I mean, at the moment, I guess we're very much looking at um, cassettes offsite, um, and as soon as you're looking at a kind of transportable unit um, that's made offsite, you're looking at something that needs to retain and contain the material within it, um, you kind of end up slightly, you know, going going back to the same concepts. But then once you get into the detail, there's infinite, um, you know, different ways of making a box, essentially, um, and different material compositions within, within that box. So yeah, I mean, it is that kind of factory mode where you're not, I guess there's a kind of in MMC, modern methods of construction, which is how the government likes to talk about it. Uh, there's kind of three scales of modular. Uh, so there's kind of the, mod, the module, which would be kind of a whole room scale module or, uh, you know, panel base. And I think we, there's, there's essentially less spatial restriction on a panel base system so i think that's why we'll always gravitate back back to that um and it's more efficient in terms of shipping um yeah yeah well that's um it's really fascinating i think to um i mean the research that we've been doing here has been quite sort of expansive but it's really great occasionally to really bring things back to buildings and, um, and to talk to people who are exploring these kinds of questions in a very grounded, um, yeah, really re resolving resolving the details, trying to get the, yeah, the air tighteners tests or whatever to work, <laughs> you know, which I think is, um, uh, yeah, very, like very necessary and um, very, uh, yeah, very interesting for us. Uh, did any of you have a, a, any final questions? I mean, I, I think, yeah, well, thanks. I mean, thanks so much for, um, for your time and for telling us about the work.